Well, oh, I'm muted. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to our May Food for Thought uh, presented by the Dutton Institute. Um, thank you. We have a nice group here um, at Dutton, and we have um, several of you joining us online too. So we're thankful that we have so many people participating. We're happy today to uh, to have Brett Fixler with us. Um, he's an instructional designer with IT Learning and Development. Um, he has lots and lots of experience. Um, and he's going to be helping all of us today, um, talking about how to um, work with our Word and PowerPoint files um, to ensure that they are accessible. So I'll turn it over to Brett. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, and thanks everyone for having me today. I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to talk about this. So as uh, was mentioned, I work for IT Learning and Development, which used to be called uh, ITS Training Services. We were granting ourselves about a year ago, and I, I like the new name a lot better. We provide a lot of different types of training on most of the um, centrally supported tools here at Penn State, uh, I2, uh, Canvas, um, sites at Penn State, the, that sort of thing. More recently, Office 365, that's been our big push for the last mm, yeah, six months or so. So, um, but I got involved with the accessibility um, things that were going on at Penn State way back when I still worked for TLT and there was a committee that was formed to address accessibility issues at Penn State. I've been involved with them. They're called the API, Accessible Technology and Information Committee. I've been involved with them ever since. And through osmosis, I've picked up a lot of stuff about accessibility. So I'm happy to be here today and I'm happy to talk about it. Um, yes, there's our objectives. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to read them to you and I don't expect you to read them. But I'm just going to cover some of what they call the basic blockers which are the most common things that you need to look for in a Word or PowerPoint document to uh, do what we call optimize for accessibility. You can never make anything perfectly accessible, 100% accessible. It's a goal that you strive for. And I'll give you an example of that. There was a uh, web page, this was probably about a year ago, there was a web page that somebody wrote and said, I ran such and such a checker on it and it determined that it was inaccessible due to this color contrast. So the API community checked it out and it turned out it was like one in 32,000 people would have an issue with this page. And so the question was, what do we do? Well, they did, they changed it, they tweaked the colors a little bit. But there's always that, um, there's always that tension between what can I do, what should I do, what must I do um, to ensure that things are as optimized as possible for accessibility. Now, I'm sure all of you here are working with materials that go out to students and so on and so forth. So you can look at it two different ways. You can say, I can wait till I get a request for accommodation and then scramble to get my content fixed and all good. And good luck with that because students don't have to request accommodations till very late in the semester. So you can really be scrambling. Or you can be proactive and get it into as part of your workflow. I'm creating this document. And this is part of my workflow now. I'm, I'm going to make sure that the the uh, tables are set correctly. I want to make sure that the images have alt text or alternative text attached. And you can do all that kind of stuff. And it's a little bit of work. It's not hard work. But once you get used to it, it becomes part of your work process. And over time, you'll figure out, oh, for a 10-page document, it's going to take me X number of minutes to do that. You can work that in for those of you that are deep time tracker to try to figure out how much it's going to take me to do this stuff. You can add that to your, your workflow. Uh, you can put it right into the timelines. So I want to show you, uh, since we're, this isn't hands-on, normally when I do a hands-on session, um, I would have you uh, get this accessibility Word and PowerPoint handout. And I would still recommend that you go here and get this. So if you go to itld.psu.edu, which is our website, and you just click on search, uh, don't, you don't have to type anything in. But then once you're there, if you filter the type of training, let's see, I get this to scroll down here. Um, you see, if you just filter it and you check accessibility, it's the easiest way I can figure to tell you to get to this. This will bring you to a bunch of stuff, but this is a handout. And this is a handout, uh, Mac folks, sorry. This is a handout that's specific to PC. Uh, most of the things are applicable to the Mac. It's just slightly different buttons you push. But a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about today, rather than go through and show you step by step how you do it, uh, I'll talk about it and maybe mention some of the things that you need to know. But it's in this document, so you can have this document and keep it. And it's uh, it seems to be relatively stable in terms that we put this together for Word and PowerPoint 2013 and 2016 came along. 
there was very minor things we needed to do to change it. So in terms of functionality from the accessibility standpoint and how you optimize your documents, it hasn't changed a whole lot, which is good. So anyway, I wanted to, I wanted to point that out to you. ITLD.PSU.EDU, do a search, uh, filter by accessibility, and it should be the first thing that comes up here. Okay, so let's go take a look. And I'm not sure whether this is going to play or not. Um, did have it share computer sound, so let's hope. Okay, I do want to bounce out. I want to show you what a screen reader sounds like for those of you who have never heard it. So people uh, with low vision uh, and or are blind will use a screen reader to read pages aloud. And it has a robotic voice. That part hasn't changed over the years, but let me see if I can get this thing fired up. And if I can't, maybe we can just copy that, put it in chat, you can go listen to it later. Heading level one, pick your perfect beach paradise. Left pair an example taken from colon http colon slash slash www.expedia.com slash daily slash theme slash vacation slash beach dot ask right parent. So many beaches, so little time. You want sunny and sandy m dash, but how do you choose from there? That depends on what you'd like to do. Here are a few ideas to get you started colon. Bullet love the nightlife. Consider Link, Cancun, and Link, Link, Jamaica, and Link, or Link, South Beach, Florida, and Link. Bullet Escape Civilization colon explore the natural beauty of Link, Kauai, and Link, Link, Turks and Caicos, and Link, or Link, Barbados, and Link. Bullet for fishing colon, Link, Los Cabos, and Link, the Link, Bahamas, and Link, and the Link, Dominican Republic, and Link are tops for deep dash sea fishing. Bullet diving colon, scuba and snorkeling are great in Link, Grand Cayman, and Link, and Link, Cosimo, and Link. Heading level 2 so many beaches so little time. All you want to do is soak up some sun, listen to the waves, and sip a tall, cool drink M dash complete with a tiny umbrella of course, but where to go? Don't worry, we've created the ultimate selection of vacation spots, so all you have to do is pack a swimsuit and dive in. Maui, graphic description colon photo of a sunset over the ocean through the trees 4.19 inches wide by 2.50 inches high. There's a reason Maui is famous for its beaches M dash, they really are spectacular when you're not just basking until you got to the point where you could actually hear the alt description of the image, and I don't really like that they had to describe the actual size of it. I think that's <laughs> but they, it's what they did. So, <laughs> um, so anyway, that's what it's like. So a couple of things. When, when I first heard a screen reader, I thought, I'm going to make an eye checkup. And um, it's very interesting because I, I worked years and years ago uh, when I worked for the uh, Institute for the Study of Adult Literacy here in the College of Ed. We used a speech synthesizer because uh, we're working with low literate adults that had no English reading skills whatsoever. And that sounds exactly, this was back in like the early 80s, it sounds exactly the same. So what's even what's even more interesting is that people that use screen readers all the time, they'll double speed it. And it's just going like this, and they, they understand it, so you do, you do get used to the speech. So I'm just throw this out there. This is the audience participation part of the session here. Uh, what does accessibility mean to you? And I, I would encourage the folks online to go ahead and either activate their mics or type in chat. Uh, it's not a trick question. There's no, there's no right or wrong here. I always think of the, the people you've already met, you know, the people that have visual um, disabilities, hearing disability, you know, that can everybody mm -hmm. be able to uh, utilize the information that we put online the same way. Sure, and I think that's the important point. Everyone can get to it the same way. Anyone else have any other thoughts? I think it, I just came back from Europe um, for a couple weeks and there a lot of things are not accessible to people. Lots of stairs, lots of curves. Mm -hmm the hallways and the bathrooms are like inches wide and I think of accessibility and allowing everyone no matter what their circumstance to be able to have access to whatever it might be mm -hmm. the bathroom text reading sound maybe I don't know I don't know how that pertains to roof climbing or you know or skydiving or you know I don't know how it how far you take it because you know i don't ever expect to be able to climb mount everest 
but I know it's tough. I don't mean, know. Yeah, yeah, that's the part I struggle with with accessibility. Yeah, I this was probably twenty some years ago, and I did a I did a session for. Um, I'm trying to think of the group, but anyway, it's down in Philadelphia, and it was on different authoring tools at the time. So we had like four different authoring tools. Well, authoring tools back then, as they are now, were very highly visual. And I had a gentleman that you know wrote to me and said, "I'm blind. Can I attend the session?" I'm like, "Well, sure, you can attend the session." But it was, I think, an epic fail for him and for me because there was just no way I could restructure the event in the time that I had to try to accommodate his needs. And even if I could trying to describe what's going on in the editor was almost impossible. So, but it is yeah. tough you, and you do try to accommodate all those different people. And did anybody online comment? No. Nope. Okay. So what do you think about this in terms of accessibility? Is it accessible and why? Well, barriers have been removed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can see your way to, to that but mm -hmm. you've got the, yeah. the, the different type of pavement there, the rumbly strips, so you know, I guess you're approaching a curb, so that's, at least it looks like it to me. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's those raised bumps, yep. so if you're using a, a cane, you can tap. Mm -hmm. Also, um, seeing eye dogs or assistive dogs are trained to know that, that that's a thing and then they need to stop and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, how about, person that uh, can can see here and walk. Yep. It's good for everyone. It's good for everyone. Exactly. That's the point here. Yeah, and, and, and this was mentioned. The idea is when you're trying to optimize for accessibility, you're, you're not trying to do something special. You're just trying to make it equally available to everyone. And that's the goal. So here's a couple of the different common accommodations that people usually look at. Um, visual is the one we always think of first, and in terms of accommodations for whether it's a print, printed, or a PowerPoint or on the web, um, you want to make sure you, you use headings in your styles, and we'll go into all this. Uh, you want to use alternative text on the images, uh, which you heard that one. It's kind of invisible text behind the scene, so that when a screen reader comes to an image, it knows what it is, or else it's just going to say image, and that's pretty much it. Um, Using descriptive link text instead of click here, you uh, actually have a link that you know when you read it. Um, visit the Penn State website would be a good descriptive link. And then you have form field identifiers for tables and, and that sort of thing. Um, for people with low vision, contrast and legibility is always important, and that needs to be kept in mind. Hearing closed captioning things um, for mobility, the keyboard shortcuts are always important. And then for you know cognitive reading and learning accommodations, things like uh, simple interface, extended time, and so on. And by the way, the visual and hearing accommodations account for about 15% of, of what's out there. The, the, it's the cognitive reading and learning um, accommodations that people don't think about, but it's like, that's what 70% of the accommodations are all about. We don't even talk about those things. We still concentrate on the visual and hearing because that's easier to do, right? It's just, you know, hey, I need to add this alt text, or I need to make sure this table is set properly. Done. A little bit harder with the cognitive stuff. So when you talk about individual, um, the preferred vernacular is a person with a disability. Try to avoid the words like handicap, deficient, special needs, crazy, wheelchair bound, that sort of thing. So it's just usually good to say, and don't say a disabled person either, say a person with a disability. So way back when we, we formed this ATI group, we talked about these things called the common blockers, and I still think they're important to know. These are the things that you most often see that people haven't addressed, or people haven't addressed these things, I guess is a better way to phrase it. Um, and it's, there they are, headings, link text, tables, alternative text for image, and specific to PowerPoint slide content order. So for headings, um, I'm going to assume most of you are familiar with styles and you use headings in the things you create, whether it's in Word or whether it's in a, a web page or whatever, you know, H1, H2, H3. Um, so screen readers will pick up on those headings and they can actually pop up a list like this 
that you see here that will let them know, um, okay, the number one heading on this page is about this site, so maybe I should go there first. Uh, quick links, you know, for instance, that might be on a web page where the links are up above the about the site header. Uh, and that's fine. It's just this gives them an idea of what are the what are the top level headings, what are the second level headings, and so on and so forth. Um, it's recommended that you only use H1 for the main title of a document or on a web page. It's only used once, and, and a lot of times the tools we have snarf that H1 and use it in terms of the page title. You can't even set something to H1. It starts at H2, which is fine. Um, H2 use H2 for all main headings, and then H3, H4 is and so on as possible. This allows the screen readers to have a hierarchy and then can slice and dice the pages up. And most importantly then, the people using the screen readers can navigate the page quicker and more efficiently. So that's, that's what headings are all about. So where do you, what do you think this is a, a good one? I was like, what, where do you think the headings are on this page? <laughs> This is, this is Penn State. It shows up three different ways. Well, okay, so let's start. What do, you th what do you think is the H1 heading on this page? The lower this is Penn State. Yeah. Yeah. The one under the pictures? Mm. No. The one right yeah. under the pictures. Right know. under the pictures. Yeah. yeah. Right. How about um, H2s? Oops, scroll down. The one in the lavender line? Yeah, I would say that's probably correct. And then H3s, if there's any H3s there. See also? Could be, could be. So imagine this page is, is and I'm not saying this page is good, bad, or, or ugly. Um, it, this page, when we look at it visually, we can, we can grasp it immediately and we can jump between. But pages like this that are visually complex with different columns and things like that, you really have to think through. If I were to close my eyes and have this read aloud to me, what would, what's the first thing I'd want to hear? What's the second thing? And so on and so forth. And that's kind of a rule of thumb. Now for simpler pages, like most Word documents, it's pretty easy. You have a title on the down title page, and that's H1. And then you have your main headers, and those are all H2s. So it's, it's, it flows straight down. On web pages, you're, you're bouncing from side to side and so on and so forth. So it's a little bit tougher. So, in terms of Microsoft Word, um, there is a built in table of contents generator, and it's deep, it goes into great detail, great detail in that handout that I, I pointed out about how to set it. I just want to point out a few things that seem kind of weird. Um, you're going to actually go in and modify whatever example you choose. You're going to modify it and you're going to uncheck the H1 because H1 should be the title of the document. And you generally don't want the title of the document to appear in your table of contents. Um, and then you make H2 the first level, H3 the second level, and so on and so forth. When you do that, if you use the build in table of contents generator, screen readers know how to read that table of contents and it greatly facilitates individuals jumping. Um, from page to page to page. And in fact, if you set the table of contents up and say, hey, I want these to be hyperlinks, so I want someone to go to the table of contents and say, okay, page 30 is uh, section five, click. Works great for people that are using screen readers as well. So keep that in mind. Like I said, I, 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 in the hands-on session, we actually go and build this thing, but it takes about 10 minutes, so I'm not gonna do that today. But it is detailed in, in, in the handout. So as far as formatting text, a good idea is to keep it 11 point or bigger if you can. Now that's on a Microsoft Word document, that's not as big a deal anymore because you can zoom the screen in and out. And same on uh, most websites, you can you know, plus or minus the, the, the font size. Um, but font color, don't use it for meaning. Uh, and this is true for people that um, are low vision and people that have excellent vision because different colors mean different things to different cultures. And what you think might be red is danger, Korean might think that means happy. So you gotta, you gotta try, try not to use it to impart meaning. Um, it's okay for aesthetics, but not, not for meaning. You also should have a strong contrast between the foreground and background. You know, for example, right here, we have black text on a white background. That's probably about as good as you can get. Um, 
It is recommended that you use the strong style of Microsoft Word as opposed to bolding. That can be a real pain. However, you can, if you do an advanced search and replace on a document that already has everything bolded, you can replace bold with the strong style throughout the document with one file swoop. Um, so it's kind of nice to know. Um, it, it takes a little bit to get used to to use that strong style, but uh, that's just a recommendation. Um, it doesn't doesn't kill the screen reader, but it, it, it does read it aloud a little bit better. So try to avoid italics. Um, and I think um, I'll show you examples of all these things. Uh, all caps, drop caps, and word art, you should avoid them because they, the screen reader doesn't read them because they're graphics. Um, but if you have to use it, take a screenshot of it, then add it back into the document as an image and have the appropriate alt text behind it. I know it's disgusting to do that, but that's what, you have. That's what they recommend that you do. Um, Brett, yeah. all caps, like if it was an acronym or something, you'd have to be in all caps. Absolutely. You wouldn't read that? Absolutely. Oh, it'll 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 read it. It'll, it'll read it, but um, there are some times where it will read each individual letter. Uh, so if it's an acronym, that's exactly what you want. But so if, if it's you were not, like, all notes should be blah blah blah. It's like A L L. Yeah, I it, it could okay. do that. Yeah. Um, so when you create your bullet in a number list, one of the common things people mm -hmm. do is like, I don't like the space between the bullets, so I'm just going to add an extra return. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. Use the built-in paragraph stuff to, to shrink or, or grow the space between because what happens is it will read something like um, um, on unordered list began bullet blah 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 unordered list end unordered list began bullet blah 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 on, and instead of unordered list began bullet 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 unordered list end. Make sense? Yeah. Um, don't include, include critical information in the headers and footers because sometimes the readers don't pick them up. So we'll just go through these real quick. Bad and good example. So try to keep as much contrast between the foreground and background as you can. Um, so try again, try to avoid those drop caps and the word art. Um, and again, if you have to use them or you want to use them, that's fine. Just take a snapshot of them and put them back in as a grab as a true graphic image and add the alt text to them. What kind of what would a good alt text example be of drop text? I would I would have it read exactly what what is read there. Drop cap. That's what I put oh, okay. for the alt verbatim. Verbatim. Just drop cap. Yeah. D. So okay. word art example. I would I would have the alt text be word art example so it reads it aloud. So it's just assuming that you were only using drop cap or word art for looks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I said, you know, just the white space, don't add extra returns between the two list items. Um, yeah, so people, they have to choose to read their headers and footers, so you really shouldn't include important information. Use it for things like the, the page numbers, you know, what we normally use it for, not footnotes or that sort of thing. Um, so let's talk a little bit about vague link experience. So here's a good one. Uh, we've all seen this. And um, screen readers can pull up a list of all the hyperlinks on a page. And if you have click here on the page 20 times, this is what you're going to see. Um, so don't use click here. Try to use um, some other type of more descriptive links here. So um, they call that the information sent. And screen readers can jump to the link. So here's what it looks like if a screen reader, if a screen reader Person using a screen reader would pull up this list of links, and you know have the screen reader allowed. That's what that would be. That's what might be on a typical page. What's read to them? So they're seeing click here, here, here. Read more, read more. They have no idea where that link is taking them. So try to avoid those. Um, try to uh, um, you know try to minimize the use of HTTP colon slash slash links. Um, you can't always do that because if it is a document that is meant for printing, right. mm -hmm. you have to include the full one. Um, and then some people will do that, like say, please visit the Penn State homepage, and in parentheses they'll put the URL. It's no hard rule there, but but just think about what you're doing. If it's a if this is something that you know people are going to experience on the web, it's probably okay to not include the HTTP colon full address, but just have a link.
So here, audience participation again. Um, pick one of those and give you a couple of a couple of. Uh, I'll give you thirty seconds here, and then we'll do some shout outs on how we could make those better. And for the folks that are online, it'd be great if you chime in too uh, via chat. Mm -hmm. I'd say that would be better. Mm -hmm. Can you think of, can you take it one step even further than that? I know this is totally out of context, but if you were to add something in between assignment one and instructions, what would you add? Like the lesson that it's coming from, so yeah. That would be, yeah, yeah, or maybe what assignment one is, uh, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. paper on such and such. So at least mm -hmm. they know that. Anybody do the second bullet point? I just hyperlink um, list of recommended books on accessibility. Mm -hmm. Leave off the word here. Yep. Mm -hmm. Great. How about the last one? Anyone take the last one? List of readings about captioning best practices. Which seems long, I know, but it's, I'm big on making sure you know where you're going. Yeah, I think that's fine. How we get rid of the click here, um, yeah. um, too, and just have it see a list of readings about captioning best practices. Mm -hmm. Excellent. You guys are all stellar. Anybody online? No? Okay. So, in terms of visual elements, you want to avoid floating objects in Word. Um, most of the times when you when you add a new image or you copy and paste an image in, it, it goes in line, which means, you know, if you put it in between two words, it goes in between theirs. And if you, you know, move the paragraph around, the, the image moves with it. But you can set an image to float, which means it just, it, it's on a different layer. It's up above the text. And the text can, you know, you can move the text around, but the image stays there. Screen readers go bonkers with that because they have no idea when they're supposed to read it. They don't know where, you know, should I read it now, should I read it then? They, they have no clue. So try to avoid that. And most of the time, you have to, it used to be that they would come in as floating images, you have to reset. Nowadays, they come in as inline images and you have to deliberately go and make them floating. So I think you're okay um, for most of the time. And use the alt text on cap in captions on all images. So let's take a look at that. Um, so have you ever had this experience where for whatever reason graphics weren't appearing on the web page or you had them turned off or anything? So this is pretty much what people experience that are using screen readers if they don't have alt text. They have no, so there that's a highly visual image, but they have no clue what those different images are. There's just no there's absolutely no way of looking at that to know. So alt text or alternative text, that's what's read um, to the viewer if an image um, is, is on the screen or it's what like you should add. There are some systems out there that will automatically add alt text when you upload an image and it will just have the, it will be the image file name, which is probably worse than anything else. Because um, it's like, you know, you know, have you all seen those images that have like numbers in them and it's like, Heck is that? No clue. Um, the thing about Twitter, when you create your alt text, try to keep it to 125 characters or less. I know you can do more with Twitter, but try to get 125, 140 characters or so. Um, if you need to do more than that, that should go either immediately before or immediately following the image in the body text that everyone can see and read. Um, try to describe the relevant parts. That should really be relevant parts of the image. Um, try to try to describe the relevant parts of the image and don't go crazy like that one we heard where it said the image is such and such inches long or such and who cares you know that's that's irrelevant don't include that also because you know we're all in education think about what is the educational purpose of that image why is it there and that's the important thing to highlight if you have a gratuitous image that's just there to make it look pretty like a flower or something like that um, you can put a single space in the alt text and the screeners will skip over it again. They won't, they won't even acknowledge it exists. Oh. Oh, so, that yeah. Just a single space. Yeah. Single space where? Uh, in the alt text the field. Alt text. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, as far as alt text, don't, don't include the credits there. Don't include snarky comments. Um, mm -hmm. 
don't include details that everyone needs to see. Put them in the body of the of the of the page itself. Um, Ian, all text is, is there's kind of an art to writing it. It takes a little bit, so it's always good to have two or three people go back and forth on a little bit. Um, but the bottom line is, if you're trying to describe something over the phone, how would you do it? That's a good rule of thumb. Isn't it also you shouldn't say photo of? Um, you shouldn't say image of or photo of or any of that kind of stuff. That's because, irrelevant. It doesn't because the screen it. reader reads it. Image. Yeah. Exactly. So it's image of image of. Yeah, it doesn't, you don't need that. So, um, so here, what do you think is the best alt text? Well, it depends what's important. I mean, if you were teaching, if it mattered Good. what they Good. looked like. Good. Okay. Then so you'd look. use sat six, but yep. if it yep. if it was, it was like a five. if it was like an art design class or something yeah. like that, or or a media design class. I'd say four. Yeah. So, sure. ima so imagine this is on um, a, um, a sales site where you can go purchase something. Yeah, because that's why those images are there, to let us know that they take those cards. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Number one is what happens in a lot, of, a lot of systems when you just upload the image. If that was the name of the image, it just throws it in there. I didn't tell you a darn thing. Uh, number three is snarky. I like that. <laughs> I, I thought about writing a spy novel where the spies were communicating via alt text in their images. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think that would be interesting. Yeah. Um, so four is probably the best one. Five credit card logos. You know, so what? That doesn't really tell you anything. Okay. There's credit card logos, but why are they there? So yeah, good. You get to pick and that's probably anyway. the one I would have done. That's what I would okay. have done. Yeah. Right. Okay. I mean, just because that's what it is. Describing the image. Yeah. Try to describe the image in the context of which, and why it's there. Why is it there? Yeah. Okay, so just take a minute here and take a look at this. Um, so the, the, the text on the left there, that's the visible caption that's either below or right beside the image itself, not the alt text. What, what alt text would you create for this image? And let's put it in context. Let's say that you are, um, you're in an art class that's you know investigating Chinese painting techniques over the ages. I would say Chinese painting shows how artists use unique variations in color to obtain effects of realism and then leave off the rest. Okay, so but but what's up here? This is this is the caption that appears for everyone. How would you describe that image? With just uh, the alt so text. A, a group of birds are attempting to eat um, fruit that's on a tree. Something okay. Like I, I don't know okay. what specific bird that is. That's, pretty, that's pretty good. I mean, that gives at least gives people mm -hmm. an idea of what the image is, what the artist was trying to impart in the image, which is, you know, the birds on the branch here with some fruit, um, checking it out, trying to think about eating it. Great. Like I said, uh, if we went around, if I, you know, when we do this in, 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 the, in the class, I actually have people write it down and compare it and get radically different things. But though what always happens is after you do that, you're like, I like the first part of yours and the third part of yours, and you put it together. And, and so I do hardly recommend, unless it's super simple images, that you run it by at least one other person and say, hey, what do you think of this? Or what would, what you can write, go and blog and say, what, how, what alt text would you write? And then, and then maybe hang on a little bit. Um, okay, so that's that for that. And then for accessible tables, um, most Microsoft Word tables are okay to start with. Um, they, they come in, they have table headers, but you do need to add a caption. And you shouldn't merge cells ever. I know we all are tempted to do that, but you shouldn't merge the cells. Um, you can do very clever things with the, the coloring and things like that to make cells that are don't have anything in them. Um, you can do things like, for example, notice how I have dashes in those. That's what you're supposed to put into a cell that's technically empty. But let's say that the cell background was white. You could put a dash in there and make the dash white. So for people that can see it, it's an empty cell. But the screen readers, when they come to it, they, they see that dash or they know that dash is there and they'll skip over that cell. Um, all columns, label all columns with table header cell. Microsoft Word, I, I haven't found a way to not do that with the new versions of Word. It just, it does create table headers for them. 
um, a new place to, you know, the dash is fine, or if you want to place an n slash a in blank cell, I would place the dash. I think that's a little bit better. And so what's what's missing from here um, in this table? Mm -hmm. The title of the table. Anything else? No caption. Yep, there's no caption. Okay, so that's just what you can see. So using this table, find the Welsh word for black. Got it? Okay. Okay. Now consider this for a person with a visual impairment, and this table was it hasn't been optimized yet. This is how it will be read. Oh gosh. So that's why it's super, super important to make sure that you have table headers and you do a few other things for it. So now the table headers are used. Find the Welsh word for white. Again, not too hard for us, but look how the um, look how the screen reader is going to read the black and white rows there. Makes it a lot nicer, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, it's re it's read as if you didn't even need a table. And, and in fact, some people will tell you if you don't need to use a table, if you can do it presented in an alternative form, like a bulleted list or something like that, don't use the table. That's the recommendation. I mean, I like tables, and sometimes I think they're just super useful. But um, if you can do it without a table, great. If you are going to use a table, make sure that you do have the table headers set. Um, and a couple other things that I showed you, and, and adding the captions. I mean, most of the stuff you can right click on a table in Word and it, you know, you get the caption thing and you can type it in. So, what's wrong with this table? Got merged several things. No headers. Yep. A title and a caption. Yep. So, there's all sorts of stuff going on with that one. What does that look familiar? <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's why I put it in here. Uh -huh. I'm like that all the time. <laughs> um, so videos should be captioned. Yeah, I think that's just that's the basic rule of thumb. Um, and since I've been doing the Office 365 stuff, there there is first of all, I know that we're we're doing work on Kaltura. I know that's coming. I don't know when. You didn't hear it from me. But uh, we also have um, uh, Microsoft Stream now, which is part of the O365 project. And Stream's pretty cool in that it on, f so the bad thing about Stream is that it's only an intranet solution. People outside of Penn State will not be able to view those videos that you upload to Stream. I, you can't get around that. But the neat thing is it does auto captioning and it does a pretty decent job if you throw something up there. And ask it to auto caption it, it, it will throw up the captioning list and then you can go and edit it. So, maybe something to think about in the future. Um, and then, ideally, bring in the outline from Word to PowerPoint. Nobody does that, but that's the ideal. You're supposed to create an outline in Word and then bring it into PowerPoint because it sets all your headers and stuff. Nobody does that. Um, but I put it in there because it's, it's recommended. Um, do add a presentation transcript to the slide notes pane. So whatever you were, if you were to present this live and whatever you're going to read aloud, put that in the, in the presentation transcript because the screen readers will read that part aloud. Um, um, you know, unless you, you know, you put a video in there, then you would caption that kind of stuff. Um, uh, do you use content placeholders like the built-in stuff? To insert charts, graphics, and text, don't copy and paste stuff in. They tell you not to do that. You're supposed to use a content placeholder and then add the image or whatever into the content placeholder as opposed to just raw, raw pasting. Um, do you create new slide masters if you need them? And I do want to show you a couple of things here. We have time, so I'll show you some of the stuff I talked about. But I want to show you the selection and visibility pane uh, to order content on the slide because that's something people, unless you've seen it, you're like, oh, I didn't know that thing existed. So, Want to go into that? Um, yeah, I don't think we need to go into all that. There's, there's just a horrible slide, way too much stuff on it. But uh, try to avoid anything that's like automate, automated, like automatic slide transmission, transmission transitions, um, complex stuff, that kind of stuff. It's, it's pretty, you know, don't use textured backgrounds, avoid red and green, that kind of stuff. 
Um, yeah, okay. So let me, let me just go one more slide here. Yeah, okay, yeah. I'm gonna bounce out here because I'm gonna go out to uh, PowerPoint here. And let's just go into the PowerPoint that I was just showing you. And let's take a look here, make sure I can get here. So I wanna show you how you can arrange the stuff on the slide in the correct order. So you go to your home tab and go to arrange. And the way down at the bottom is a thing called selection pane. If you don't remember that, you can always type into help selection pane and show it to you. But what this is doing here, this brings up this little pane here, and this is showing me, and this is in reverse order, so the thing in the bottom is actually red first. And if I click on that, I can see what's red. Then that's second, and that's third. Now that is indeed exactly what I want, but let's just say I can click and drag these things around. Excuse me, so let's say for whatever reason I wanted the title red first. I wanted whatever alt text I attached that image red next and then I wanted that text read last. That's how you do it. So it is, it goes bottom up and you can reorder things and most of the time, if you're using default templates, the order is fine. Um, but if you go and add like an extra thing in there or something like that, you might want to, for whatever reason, you might want to go in and make sure that it's reading it in the correct order. What happens if you make a PDF of your PowerPoint? So we're going to talk about PDFs, okay. but, but, but no, that's okay. Um, the, the recommend is, first of all, it's recommending you don't use PDFs, but I mean, that's crazy because okay. everyone uses them. Um, but the recommended process to do that is to optimize your Word document or your PowerPoint document first, and then create the PDF out of that, and it will be better. It still won't be as good. What we started doing in our shop is um, when we have a document that's available, we'll create it in Word first, and we'll put that up on our site and we'll say, this, one, this has been optimized for accessibility. Then we'll create the PDF and we'll say, this one's optimized for printing. Okay. So that people can choose which one when they get to the site. Uh, I'm gonna print this. Okay, use the PDF. It's formatted exactly, you're not gonna have to worry about headers bouncing over bleeding, you know, bleeding lines or any kind of stuff. So. Okay. Um, okay, so that's, I mean, that's basically what I'm gonna show you with PowerPoint. Everything that I talked about was really for Word, but it was all for PowerPoint. This is the one unique thing in PowerPoint is the slide order. And also creating new slide masters and using them, um, you know, in case you want to like, you want to create a three column slide master. It's better to do that and use the master than it is to just keep adding a column on it, two column slides. Um, they just recommend that the, the readers pick up on it better. Is that because you can set the selection in the master and then it's just set for all of them? You don't have to kind of do it every single time? Yeah. yeah. So is there anything that we talked about that you want me to show you? Because I can go and I mean, we have time. I wasn't sure I'd have enough time here. But I mean, I can show you stuff in Word as well, too. You know, for example, I guess I could go and show you the table of contents. I think I have time here. So uh, let me see here. Let me click there. And then I believe it's under here. If I can find it here. Uh, I haven't created anything here for a while. So. What the table of contents is. I practiced this on my Mac this morning, but uh, I'm on a PC. Now. Mm -hmm. Can you just, is there a way to search for it? I'd like to know how to. Yeah. I feel like every update to the higher on the. There it is. Automatic. So, you where it is. Yeah, it doesn't show you where it is. That's really what yeah. it's on. <laughs> Yeah, it should. And it should be right in here. So I thought it was right in here somewhere. But um, web design is underway now. I'm sure as heck one of the other references. All right, where's the other one? Here it is. Where you are square? Our left. Nope. Reference. Oh, there it is. Uh, references. That's intuitive. That's really. <laughs> I can't remember. So. 
Um, all, the way, um, all the way over here. Oh, 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 oh yeah. Oh, I'm having a hard time seeing it because of this stuff. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay. So here's here's what you would do here. You would go down here and go down and say, I want to get a custom table of contents. And then let's say that, yeah, I like that because of the, you know, the, the look of it, that's fine and everything like that, but you can go ahead and modify Oops, our options. And you go down here and just take that out, change this to a one, change the three to a two, and then finally a two to a three, and say okay, and say okay. And so that is actually created a table of contents based on the styles that I've already added here. I added different heading levels down throughout the document. And the screen readers will read this correctly. And if you created this by, by hand, if you like typed executive summary, dot, 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 remember, that's what's going to read. So you don't, if you don't want to do that. Uh, the nice thing about this is for the table of contents, if you, you know, let's say you add something in and you put a proper style, you can always come in here and you know right click on this and update the update the and say update or update the entire table and it'll just automatically update it for you. So it's a real it can be a real time saver if you use it. And you know, like I said, this is all based on the fact that I went in here and you know I made this a particular style and I made these all these are all H2s. Um, and this was an H1. Which I had styled according to you know, the way that I wanted it to style. Um, let's scroll down through here. And here's an interesting thing. This was brought in from Excel. And if you wanted to add alt text to this, which you should, if you click on the inside of it like that, let's not highlight everything. And you can't really add the alt text to it. You kind of, so for an image you bring in from Excel like that, you kind of got to go up and find some blank space. And click on it there to highlight the whole thing, and then you can right click on it. Um, I can insert a caption if I wanted to. And notice how Word's pretty nice and it knows what the order is that, that your images are in the document. So you know you can decide you want a dash or whatever, bigger one, spring one, or whatever. That will get um, do that. And then let's see here. I can always go here. And click on that. This is where you can check to see if it's floating or not. Mm -hmm. So it is in line with text, which is what you want. <laughs> so that's good. Let's see here. Finally. So if you go down to that very bottom choice, this is super intuitive, folks. You get, to, <laughs> you get to that bottom choice, and then you go over to this incredibly intuitive icon and click on that, and that's where you actually have your text. Wow. That nice. I, thought, I definitely, I'm glad we had time because I wanted to show you that. It's one thing to say, go out alt text, but you don't know how to do it. Um, and oddly enough, you can put something in the title if you want to, but you don't really need to. Okay. Word will read what's in the description. That's where you should have the alt text. Not the title. You don't have to. I mean, you can if you if you want to do overkill, you can put something in the title, but the screen readers don't read it. So in this case, I might put something um, in here that um, you know, this this uh, chart defines the most popular training sessions, um, and that's probably where I would leave that. And I would add some information underneath the chart that listed nine percent did this, you know, ten percent did this. I would list that in the body of the text. Takes a little bit more space, but you can't really do that in alt text because you'll have way too much and it just won't read it aloud well. Whereas if, if you put it in underneath the image in this particular case, this is a pretty visually complex image and it has a lot of data in it. That's what I would do with that. Yep, same for that one. This one is, again, go get great click on it, format the picture, go over here. And add your alt text. You can also do the same thing on the whole table here not. Um, so let's add a table here. So um, 
by the way, don't ever use the straw table. I don't know why I've been told not to ever do that for accessibility purposes. So use this grid here. I'll create that. And then same thing, you can highlight the table. You can go to table properties. You can insert a caption, which is true. You can go to table properties. And you can also add all text for the table. And you don't necessarily absolutely have to do that, but it's not a bad idea either if it's a, if it's a pretty complex table. And the alt text for images in PowerPoint is pretty much the same as it is in Word, right? So if you throw in a same image in your PowerPoint, same you concept. right click format image and click yep. on the unintuitive yep. icon. Yep. Okay. Yep. Every, everything's pretty much the same between the two of them, except for that ordering and what when things are read on the slide. That's that to me is the main difference. You know, once in a while you need to create a new slide master, but that's not that's not we don't do that on a regular basis. We do add images in. So, folks, I know we have about seven minutes. What questions do you have? You know, that's a lot to cover. Anyone online have any questions? It's great. I learned. I thought I knew this stuff, but I learned some new things. <laughs> I know. Seriously, I wish I learned a couple of these things before I did my dissertation, but. Mm -hmm. Did you save a little time? Did you have to make that accessible? You are given, the university has a template that you have to use, and I'm sure it's accessible. And it uses all the styles and so forth. What I didn't know was that it would have automatically looked at the figures. That really nice. <laughs> and no, no one made me do um, alt text on any of my images. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. So the tables would have been in compliance, but any images wouldn't have. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I know I didn't know to go add alt tags. Now, I mean, so so for the PowerPoints, like that PowerPoint I just showed you, that I didn't optimize that for accessibility because I know it's for this group and everything like that. Um, most of the time when we do that, it's if it's if it, we know we're distributing it, um, or if I'm going to um, present at some sort of conference and I know that they want the, the media. I'll take the time to optimize the documents for accessibility. So I know when they're uploaded there, there's no issues. And again, I've never gone to a conference where they've said, you know, please yeah. make sure it's optimized. Um, but I think it's kind of value added. And since we know that we should do it, we should do it. So. Well, those slides get distributed all over the world. Once they're out there, they get yeah. shared a lot. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's I think it's a good thing to do. So. What else you got, folks? Is there anything you've run into? Well, I did have a question. We, we utilize a lot of charts and graphs relating to like U.S. Census Bureau data over time, and for like an image that we saw in the PowerPoint just above, I mean, oftentimes the actual individual numbers are not the items that we're trying to get across. We're trying to explain like, you know, the following chart highlights over time, you know, with different criteria and how it either population grows or certain statistics. Is that how you would ex provide alt text? More like a telephone description of it rather than just like pro providing data points yeah. essentially? Yeah, I think that would be good. And then, and then in the body of the text near that image, I would try to, since you say here's the trend, I would say this is what we're seeing with this trend. I've seen something or in this context, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is this is the analysis that we that we derived from this chart. Yeah, we're oftentimes bouncing it back and forth between faculty members. I think you highlighted an important part where it's like it's important to get feedback and like the work because what you write might be different than what I'm thinking of and how it all comes together. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, we do, like in my unit all the time. We're, we always are cross checking each other's stuff, and it's become uh, real interesting. Oh, it's almost a diversity issue where I look at the world a certain way, so I'm going to describe something in a certain way, and other people look at it and say, "Bet I had no idea. I, I didn't understand how you just described that, and I would have described it this way." And I'm like, "Okay, I can kind of see that," and then eventually you arrive at a consensus that hopefully a broader audience will understand what you wrote. It's tough. English is a terrible language. Yes. <clears throat> We have challenges in quiz questions, putting alt text on because you're trying not to give the answer. So, yeah. in, in the 
Well, I'm describing the okay. image. A charter. Yeah, we've seen right. that. Right. Yeah. You're trying to. The you know, trends show. Yeah. Right. So you're trying. And then the question is what do the trends show? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. So on those, we try to just describe them as they look. Okay. Because. Well, yeah. That, in the context of what you're doing, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah, it's all about the it's all about the context in which the images are used. So, yeah, it's all you said. It's been a it's been an interesting time figuring all this stuff out and working with it. Now. And it's just now it's just it's part of my workflow. If I know a document's going outside of the shop, it's not an internal document. You just say, okay, I'm going to delete this, that, and the other thing, and you just do it. You don't even think about it anymore. It's just it's more or less a habit. So, and that's where I hope we all get to because we we don't want the National Federation of the Blind come back on us ever again. That's the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do, yeah. So. Well, thanks, folks. I really, really appreciate thank you having me. Thank you. Yeah. Definitely. Thank it's you for fun. coming. It's fun. I've been over here in a couple of years, so it's fun. Well, we'll see you. Come visit. Yeah. yeah. Yes. It's a lot nicer than ours. Let me tell you. <laughs> thanks, Thanks. Yes. Thank you. I'll let that as is, and you yep. can do whatever you want to leave the files and leave me out there. But, okay. Uh, new top secret stuff. Okay. <laughs> we appreciate it. Take dessert with you. Anybody in the room, feel free to take some back to your office. That's, that's, that's yeah, dangerous. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yes, I'll take care of that for you. All right. I'll take it.